Good morning, folks. Welcome to the 2023 annual staff retreat day. Thanks for everybody for coming out and coming early. Yay. Our chief of staff leading applause, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Danielle Pelzarski. Please continue to eat, enjoy the breakfast and the drinks and refreshments. Uh, I'm going to start with a few housekeeping items. Uh, first, I'm Greg McGrath on year 18 of a one-year plan at Norwich as the Dean of Students here now, um, and happy to MC this. Uh, Kyle Southworth, thank you so very much for tagging me for it. Um, you owe me. <laughs> We're going to go with some announcements and then raffle winners, and then I'll introduce Jesse Drown to talk about the staff survey results. Okay, so um, please. An announcement, a reminder, please check the board for the time and location, some things may have changed or will change, of your sessions, so check time um, and location on the board. Big reminder, we've tied two things together this year, and that is this event and the uh, annual employee recognition event, and this is the first time we've been able to combine the two, and it's the first time since 2019, I believe, that we've had the employee recognition event in person. So that's very exciting. Please join us this afternoon. That'll be from 3 to 4.30 back here in Plumley Armory, so please join us for that. Now, I'm going to ask a good colleague and friend of mine, Sherry Campbell, to please come up here. Sherry, are you still here? She disappeared? Oh, that was her saying no, hiding at the stars. Sherry, come on up, you've won a prize. So our first raffle winner of the day is Sherry Campbell. Sherry has won, sorry Megan, but she has won a day off. Thank you. Thank you. Be careful on the stairs. Yes. All right. All right, congratulations, Sherry. Please don't use that today. We'd like you to stay with us. All right, now here's an interesting one. Is Scott Wills with us? All right, Scott, congratulations. Do you know what you won? You won the President's Meatballs. And so it says here in my notes, Scott, that any time between midnight and 4 a.m., just ring the President's doorbell and they'll, they'll be there ready for you. Okay? That's <laughs> perfect. Um, the, the real answer is that he's going to, I think, personally deliver them to you at some point on campus. Hopefully, we'll check to make sure you're here and working, uh, but you get the President's Meatballs personally delivered for you. Congra congratulations. All right, and Jesse Drown, is Jesse here? All right, I'm sorry you didn't win anything, but you win the opportunity to come on stage. <laughs> Jesse's our chair of the staff council. All right, and Jesse, you get to take over. Excellent. All right. Hi, everyone. Hello. Um, so Anna's going to help me pull up a couple slides very quick. I'm going to take a few minutes just to um, go over high-level results of our survey that everyone just took. And I appreciate you all um, taking that survey. It really helps us. bar is, but it says staff council under that. Uh, <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> um, so just as an intro, um, staff council is an advisory body, part of shared governance, who serve the president of Norwich University both through the dean of the fa I mean, I'm sorry, uh, we serve them through the chief of staff's office. Sorry, this is an old... Uh, Old note, but we have recently moved. Yes, <laughs> uh, we serve through the chief of staff office now with our new realignment. Um, so we are charged with effectively representing all university staff constituencies and assuring that your staff issues are considered in a lot of those decision-making processes. Um, and why do we do this survey? 
So we want to be engaged with our constituents. We want to hear what's going on, and we want you to know that we're here for you. So we like to track, and we started this three years ago, the level of engagement that you either see in us or your likelihood to reach out to us. So this really helps us to see where we need to improve. And we also ask questions about what are those topics that are of interest to you? What's on your mind? Where can we help? It really helps form our agenda for the next year. As a, a brief sidetrack, our current members, many of which are here today, we have David Kisner, Kelly Sutton Bosley, Brad Gallimore, Ben Sabo, Rob Berkey, Lee Hatch. I am currently the chair. Lori Lamoff is my vice chair. And Julie Gutzel is our executive secretary. So thank you all for your service. Um, we are looking for members, so we'll get to how you can do that in a sec. Okay. So over time, I just wanted to give you a brief glimpse. So response rate, how many people are taking our survey? That tells us how involved you want to be with us. When we kicked it off, we got a pretty good response rate, about 38%. Um, we dropped last year. I'm sure due to a number of reasons, but I'm happy to report that we're coming back this year. We had 165 responses, that's a great number, and 36%. So I'm happy to report that we're getting some more numbers, that means more participation, and that's a good element. So the first two questions on our survey relate to how engaged is staff council, and how likely are you to reach out to us? As you can see, we're happy to report an upward trend. Um, when we started back in 2021, we were at about, this is a one to six scale, at about a 2.82, um, and then also at about a 2.3. So we have really worked to be more engaged and that you feel more comfortable reaching out to us. We hope to improve on these numbers, but it's a really good trend. So we get to the, what are the topics that you all are talking about? Um, and we ask a couple questions to find out what are those issues that are of importance, right? Um, we do plan to go into more detail. A report of this will be available, and we actually have a meeting next week. Our coffee with the council will be dedicated to the detail of this type of presentation. But in general, these are the topics that come up most frequently. Compensation is the biggest thing on everybody's mind, um, as far as our survey results reveal. Benefits comes in a second. Remote work and professional development seem to be hovering around that third area. But some other areas that came up were communication, employee management items like performance management, training, supervisor training, and also this idea of culture and improving campus morale. So, Brandy Dewey is our survey winner. Um, every year we ask you to give your name. We do not use your name in results or reporting. We merely stick it into the super fun wheel and pick a winner. So Brandy has won a sweatshirt courtesy of Follett Bookstore. And um, I will contact her. Um, I will contact her to um, connect you with Follett, and you can pick out your sweatshirt and your correct size. So I promised I'd be quick. Um, in closing, this says, learn more about staff council. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> our email, please reach out to us if you have questions. Um, we do have membership. You are welcome to take a look at that. But if you just want to reach out, use our email, staffcouncil at norwich.edu. We do have a SharePoint site. There's a lot of stuff on there. Please check it out. There is a tab to apply to join Staff Council. We, in June, will have some new membership. Our some terms end. We are looking for new members. Um, we like to be at a body of 12. So if you are interested, if you have one year of staffship under your belt, please reach out. Um, we need good people, and the more hands, the less work it is for everybody else. Um, also on there are our agendas. Everybody is welcome to attend a meeting, our meeting minutes, 
and our Coffee with the Council recordings have recently been uploaded. So if you missed one, feel free to go in there and take a peek. You should be able to review any of the ones in the last fiscal year. Also, for today, uh, there are links there because we want to make it easy for you to um, nominate folks for all these HR awards. So always check that out as well and nominate your fellow staff members for the good work that they do. Um, in closing, I want to announce that our next Coffee with the Council is going to be next week, March 15th, 10 o'clock as always, um, and we're going to go into these survey results a little deeper. Um, what were those numbers? What do the trends look like? And really what we're looking for is now that we have all this, what do we do with it? Based on this data, how can we help to form an agenda, priorities, and where are those staff council uh, touch points that we can help you all with? So that's all I have for today. And thank you. While we're getting reset up, can I ask our staff council members that were introduced, please stand for just a moment for some recognition. Those of you serving currently, round of applause, please. Thank you all. I appreciate you all. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Thank Thanks. you, Jesse. Yeah. Thank you, Jesse, and staff council members for your service. We greatly appreciate it. Thanks very much. Um, I now have the honor and the privilege of introducing Rebecca Schubert. Rebecca, where's Rebecca? There she is. So this is Rebecca off to the side over here. Rebecca is here from the Green Mountain uh, Higher Ed Consortium, and she's going to speak with us about human flourishing and the good life. That's it. Without further ado, <laughs> Rebecca, please join us. Hello. Thank you so much for having me today. I'm so excited to be here. So I just celebrated my fifth year in my current role with the Green Mountain Higher Ed Consortium. And Norwich Staff Retreat was the first event I attended when I started this role back in uh, the end of 2017, 2018. And I remember that day being so wonderful and exciting because all of you were so welcoming. Ellen Liptak was here at the time. I'm sure you all remember Ellen. Um, and she was so passionate about well-being and working with me that um, I just really fell in love with Norwich. And I also remember that day President Schneider. How many of you were here when President Schneider was here? Yeah. I had never seen someone so fully embody leadership and being a leader as President Schneider. And I just remember being so excited and feeling like I found my place here. And so when the staff retreat planning committee asked me to be the keynote speaker for today's event, I of course said yes. And so when I thought about the theme of staff retreat uh, for a new you, I started thinking about what does that actually mean? What does for a new you mean? And I started thinking about, you know, New Year's Eve, it's always New Year, new this, new that, right? And so I got to thinking about the idea of a new you and a new me and what it meant. And I wondered, did that mean moving towards some different version of myself? Did it mean trying to change who I was? Did it mean adopting some big, new, grand habits or ideals? And ultimately, what I realized was that a new you or a new me really meant moving towards being the best version of ourselves. For me, it means building on our strengths and amplifying ourselves in a way that brings fulfillment and meaning and purpose and contribution to our lives. And so that's what I want to talk to you about today. So in the next half an hour or so, what I want to talk with you about is human flourishing. I want us to define what flourishing is. 
I want to share with you a little bit of research behind flourishing. And I want to share with you some strategies for how you can enhance flourishing in your own life. So that by the time you leave here today, you will have some tools in your toolbox to help you move towards flourishing. So I want to start out by posing a question. And that is, what is a good life? So when you think about good life, what comes to mind? Anyone? Say that again. Good health. Good health. Family. Family. What else? Connection. connection. Social connection. What else? Grown-up children. <laughs> Say it again. Grown-up Grown children. Who have? <laughs> Your children have successfully grown the net, grown and flown the nest. What else? Happiness. Happiness. Anything else? Good life? Stability. Stability. Okay. So if you were to Google the definition of good life, the first thing that would come up is a life of luxury, of pleasure, and material comfort. Now, that might sound good, but it might not really be that fulfilling. You see, happiness is not all it's cracked up to be. Many people will say a good life is a life that is happy. And sure, we all want that, right? But can you really imagine being happy all the time? That would be kind of boring. And we'd really miss out on a lot. And that brings us to the second definition of a good life. And that is a way of living that is moral, satisfying, and fulfilling. Now that sounds a lot more interesting. You see, if we really want to live the good life, we have to experience the full breadth and richness of life. And that means experiencing the ups and the downs. Because without bitter, we can't appreciate sweet, right? Without hardship, we can't experience gratitude. Without service and contribution, we don't have a sense of meaning and purpose. And so a full life, a rich life, is one that we experience in all it has to offer. So that brings us to the definitions of flourishing. And the idea of flourishing has been around really since the beginning of time. So Jesus defined flourishing as a life in all its fullness. Aristotle defined it, de defined it as success as a human being. I like Abraham Maslow's definition. He says, flourishing means to become more and more of what one is, to become everything one is capable of. That's self-actualization, right? Becoming everything that we are capable of. And the Mental Health Foundation of New Zealand defines flourishing as a state where people experience positive emotions, positive psychological functioning, and social functioning most of the time. So the definition that we're going to work off of today was developed by Martin Seligman, and he is the past president of the American Psychological Association. And he defines flourishing as having five distinct domains. Positive emotions, engagement, meaningful or positive relationships, a sense of meaning and purpose, and achievement. And now while these things sound simple, they may not actually be that easy because life has a way of hijacking our time and our attention. And so if we really want to flourish in our life, we have to be intentional. We have to stay focused and we have to put in some effort and sometimes that means setting boundaries with ourselves so that we can allocate our time and our energy to the things that are most important, and that will support us flourishing and living the good life. So before we get into the nuts and bolts of flourishing and some tools around PERMA and how we can optimize our well-being across these different domains, I want to share with you a little bit of research. So since Martin Seligman's theory of flourishing came out, there have been many, many studies on the constructs of PERMA. And what the researchers are finding time and time again is that people who have optimized these five domains have better physical and mental health, more job satisfaction, 
more life satisfaction in general, more satisfying relationships, better performance at work at school, decreased psychological stress, decreased likelihood of chronic disease, and longer life expectancy. Now, who wouldn't want all of that, right? And the good news is, is that to enjoy or reap all of these benefits, this is largely within our control. And whether or not we are flourishing and living the good life really depends on us living with intention and taking action to move in the direction of PERMA. So are you flourishing or are you languishing? These are two ends of the spectrum, right? Um, and so how do you know? Here's some questions to ask yourself. So as I read these questions, just think about your own answers. I'm not going to ask you to share your answers out loud, so rest assured. Um, and just rate yourself in your own mind on a scale of 0 to 10. 0 being uh, not at all and 10 being extremely. How satisfied are you with your life in general? How would you rate your physical health? How happy or unhappy do you generally feel? How clear are you on your purpose in life? How content are you in your relationships? Do you often feel worried or overly stressed? Do you practice delayed gratification? Or are you someone who tends to give in to your emotions and do what is comfortable or convenient now? Do you look for the good in situations, or are you someone who tends to be more pessimistic? And how would you rate your overall mental health? So as we move through the rest of our time together and we talk through the constructs of PERMA, just note any areas where you feel like maybe things are not where you'd like them to be. Um, so you can maybe focus on what you might be able to do to enhance those areas for yourself. So if your answers to those questions point you toward flourishing, then that's amazing. You're either already living the good life or you're well on your way to living a good life. If your answers to these questions are not what you would like, don't despair. With a little bit of effort, you can change things and move in a more positive direction. Now, keep in mind that flourishing will take work. No one lives a good life by accident. So we've got to be intentional and we've got to take action and be the captain of our own ship. So let's talk now through the constructs of PERMA um, and learn a little bit more about them and what we can do to enhance our flourishing in each of these domains. So the first construct of PERMA is positive emotions. Now, remember what I said about happiness and it not being all it's cracked up to be. Positive emotions does not mean that you pretend to be happy all the time or that you pretend to be happy when you're not. It also doesn't mean pushing away negative emotions, but it means boosting your positivity ratio so that you can enjoy and experience more positivity in your life. So researchers have found that the optimal positivity ratio is three to one. So that means that you would be experiencing three times more positive emotions to negative emotions if you're flourishing in this area. So, so often when something bad happens in our life, someone cuts us off in traffic, we get bad news, something doesn't turn out as we would like, we have an argument with a friend or a family member, what do we do? We tend to ruminate about it, right? We go around and around about it in our mind, and we essentially circle the drain until we've talked ourselves into this downward spiral, only making it worse, right? But how often do we ruminate when good things happen? Or we experience some positive emotion? Rarely, right? We so quickly glance over those things, whether it be uh, a thank you from a coworker, or a hug from a spouse, or you know, whatever it is, we just sort of jump right by it, and we don't take the time to savor it. Barbara Fredrickson is a researcher at UNC Chapel Hill, and she developed a theory on positivity that she calls the broaden and build theory of positivity. And her theory states that positive emotions open our hearts and our minds making us more creative and receptive, and building our resources, our resilience resources, and enabling us to better face challenge and stress. 
So that makes a lot of sense, right? Because when you're experiencing some negative emotion, how do you tend to feel? Closed, tight, narrow, right? When we experience positive emotions, it opens us up. We feel light, expansive, receptive, right? And so according to Barbara Fredrickson, the resources that we gain from positivity build over time and increase our resilience and our well-being. And that moves us into a positive spiral. So the more positive emotions we experience, the more well-being we have, the more resilience we have, the more well-being we have, right? It's this upward cycle. So how do we boost our positivity ratio? There's really three main things that we can do that has been shown to significantly enhance positivity. Number one, savoring positive emotions. Number two, you've probably all heard about practicing gratitude. And number three is uh, a journaling exercise that we call your best possible future self. So I want to do uh, a, a quick exercise about savoring positive emotions. So on the slide are 10 common positive emotions. Serenity, interest, hope, pride, joy, love, awe, amusement, etc. So I want you to take a look at the list. Pick out one positive emotion that you've experienced recently or you can think about a time in your life when you've experienced it. Now again, we're not going to share this out loud. So think about the time that you experienced that positive emotion. What were you thinking? What were you feeling? What were you seeing? Who were you with? Maybe what you were smelling? What did it feel like in your body to experience that? So just close your eyes for a minute. Try to put yourself back in that moment. And really, as best you can, in as much detail as you can, soak in that feeling. And, and let it really permeate into your body so that you can feel it in your bones. Okay, you can open your eyes. So that is what savoring positive emotions is. And that is one of the best ways to enhance our positivity. And the good news about it is we have so many opportunities every day to do this if we just pay attention when we're getting a hug from a spouse or a child, when we see our child or our grandchild be excited about learning something new or uh, completing a task that they were trying to do or uh, a sunset or a sunrise that we experience on our way to or from work. Really pay attention to those moments and just ruminate on it for a minute. That's what savoring positive emotions is and that is easily accessible to everyone and it's something you can do anytime and it boosts our positivity. There's so many opportunities uh, if we just pay attention. So the second way we can increase positivity is to practice gratitude. And we've all heard about this, right? Um, but really the most effective way to practice gratitude to enhance positivity uh, is to spend five minutes once a week for 10 weeks writing down and reflecting on five things you are grateful for. And the more specific you can be, the better. So you don't just want to say, my job, my husband, my kids, my dog, my house, right? You want to really think about specific examples. That connection I had with my best friend uh, when she blah, 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 right? Whatever it is, the more detail we can garner, the more likely we are to be able to increase our positivity with this. So practicing gratitude. The other is called your best possible future self exercise. And I really like this exercise. So to do this, what you would do is you would think about your life in the future. Imagine that everything went exactly as you want it to be. It's like the realization of all of your dreams and goals. You've worked hard and succeeded at everything you wanted to be. It could be, uh, it could, it could incorporate your job, your health, your friends, your family, uh, romantic partner, hobbies, goals. And spend 15 minutes a day, two weeks, journaling about it. 
So not only does that boost positivity in the short run, but the other thing it does is it keeps us focused on what's most important. Any of you familiar with that movie, The Secret, or the book, The Secret? Anyone remember that? I think Oprah was a big fan of that, right? It was kind of like manifesting your dreams. Um, and and I, I honestly didn't watch the movie, but it makes a lot of sense because what you focus on becomes what you focus on, right? And so when I'm, when I'm focused on the realization of all of my dreams, it helps put in perspective and make clear what it is I want in my life, which means I'm more likely to actually make decisions that move me in alignment with that. So best possible future self exercise. The E in PERMA stands for engagement, otherwise known as flow. So when we're in flow, we're totally in the zone. We're so wrapped up in the movement, in the, in the moment, that we lose track of ourselves. We lose track of time and consciousness. We become one with the activity. So we might look back on the experience and find ourselves thinking, I was totally challenged, but I knew I could rise to the occasion. Or it felt like things were happening in slow motion. People who report the most flow states are happier, they report less stress, improved performance, and they experience more creativity and higher levels of motivation. So um, there's a lot of research done on extreme athletes, right? and put people who put themselves in these sort of life or death situations. And we used to think that they did that for the adrenaline rush, right? Like skiers who did helicopter skiing off you know, crazy peaks or um, you know, scuba divers who swim with the sharks, that kind of thing. But what they found out is it's not the adrenaline rush that lures these people, it's actually the desire for the experience of flow. So how many of you have experienced being in flow in your life? What are, some of the, what are some of the things that put you into flow? Anyone? Yeah? I, uh, I went on a ride in a, a, a non-engine glider. Ooh, a glider. So it was, it was serene and quiet. Uh-huh. A, a little bit on the dangerous side, but the pilot knew what he was doing. And so you were just so lost in that moment. Yeah. What else? Anyone else experience flow? Yeah? Yeah, I, I'm a big mountain biker in the water. So for me, to be able to get on a good powder day and ride a good tree and it just you're just zoned out. You're totally focused. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's like your body's on autopilot. Yep. Yeah. You're not thinking about what do I do with my arm or my leg, right? You're just there and it's sort of just like happening and you're just in it. Anyone else? So so people have experienced flow, glider ride, skiing snowboarding, maybe it's when you're knitting, maybe it's running. That's never happened to me, by the way. Uh, <laughs> uh, maybe it's doing a puzzle or being in conversation, or dare I say, when you're working, right? Work can be a source of flow. So how do we encourage flow states in our life? One thing we can do is to set clear goals that have immediate feedback, goals that aren't too hard, but aren't too easy because flow happens at the intersection of skill and confidence, right? When you're, when, you're put, when you're riding down that hill that seems a little scary, but you know you can do it and you have the skills and you've got the confidence, but you're still pushing yourself just a little, that's when we can get into flow. Um, the other thing that we can do is to focus on the process instead of the outcome. That keeps us focused and being in the present moment. We can also uh, be self-directed and take action to determine how we're going to achieve our goals. And the other thing we can do is single task. How many of us have a habit of multitasking, right? What happens when we're multitasking? We're jumping from this, that, to the other, and back again, right? Not only is it completely inefficient because our brain has to rewind to get back to where we were when we left that task, but uh, it diverges our attention. The only way we can get into flow is when we're focused on the present moment. The only time that flow can happen is now. Okay, the R in PERMA is positive or meaningful relationships. And these are ones where we feel valued, supported, and loved. 
And we include relationships in this model because human beings are social creatures and we cannot thrive or live in isolation. Are you all familiar with the blue zones? Anyone heard of the blue zones? A couple people, not many. So this is pretty fascinating. So the blue zones are areas in the world where people enjoy some of the highest levels of well-being and life expectancy. Areas such as places in Costa Rica, California, Greece, Japan. What do all those things have in common? A, they have beautiful warm weather, right? They have an abundance of access to fresh, healthy foods. Um, and they've studied the people there extensively to figure out what it is about people who live in these blue zones that really set them apart in terms of their well-being and their life expectancy. And what they found is that people who live in these areas get a lot of physical activity. That doesn't mean they exercise. They're not doing intentional exercise, but they have active lives. So they move around a lot throughout their day. They also tend to eat very healthy diets based around whole foods. They're not eating a lot of packaged and processed foods. They take time to decompress. Uh, it's not that they don't experience stress, but they allow themselves to engage in healthy practices which help them to mitigate or manage the stress. But one thing that sets people here apart is that they prioritize relationships. They have very strong social networks. And what we know is that poor relationships and isolation are linked with poorer health, depression, increased risk of chronic disease, and increased early death. So relationships really are key to our well-being and our longevity. So how can we improve our relationships? One thing we can do is we can celebrate people's successes and try not to one-up them or put it back on us. How many times have you shared something with someone? Oh, you'll never guess what happened to me, this. And they go, oh, that thing happened to me too. And then all of a sudden, it's like, it's there. It's about them, right? It means celebrating people when they share with you and not putting it back on yourself. It means listening mindfully and paying attention to people. Making eye contact with people shows that you care and that you value them, and that enhances relationships. That means putting down our phones, closing our computer screens, right, and really just being present with people when we're with people. We can also be curious about people. People like to talk about themselves, right? And it's interesting because the more questions we ask about people, the more we get them talking about themselves, the more they tend to like us. So that's a great strategy for getting people to like you is to be curious and ask about them. The other thing we can do is to work to cultivate more friendships with people that we may just be acquaintances with. We can also join a club, a religious group, engage in some sort of activity that has a social component. Uh, we can step out from behind our computer screens, get off Zoom, go for a walking meeting, um, and really engage with people physically. The other thing in terms of relationships um, is around participation in religious services. So. Uh, church and other religious services are one of the best ways to build relationships. And research from Gallup shows that people who participate in re religious services on a regular basis have much higher levels of well-being. Okay, so the, mean, the M in PERMA is around meaning and purpose. And that means having a sense of value and a sense of worth. And belonging to or serving something greater than ourselves. Having a purpose in life helps us to focus on what's really important, especially when we're faced with significant stress or challenge. We can find meaning and purpose through our work, some cause that we find uh, near and dear to our heart, activism, religious service, etc. So how do we find more meaning and purpose? We can get involved in a cause or an organization that's important to us. We can try new things to find things that we might be interested in. We can use our passion to help others, right? Thinking about how we can use our own unique strengths and gifts and talents to serve other people. We can connect to our core values. And we can spend quality time with the people that we care about. Quantity time versus quality time, right? They are not the same thing. So when you're sitting around in the evening watching TV with your husband and he's sitting there on, on his phone and you're, you know, watching TV or whatever, you're not really kidding. You're laughing over here. Are you laughing at that? 
Say that again? No idea what you're talking about. Right. But you're, but you're not really engaged in quality time, right? I find one of the best ways to engage in quality time is to share a meal. Sitting at the table without phones or TV, right? And just really connecting with people. Um, but meaning and purpose doesn't have to be some huge, big, grand ideal. It can be as simple as being kind to people <clears throat> or looking for ways to add value to the world around us. When it comes to work, we can find meaning and purpose just by thinking differently about our work and how it serves something bigger. There was a really interesting study done some years ago um, on folks who worked in hospital setting doing custodial jobs. And they interviewed folks who were working in these positions, which are typically um, lower paying jobs and very difficult in physical work, right? So you'd think that maybe these people wouldn't really enjoy their job. But what they found is people who thought differently about their work actually felt a great sense of meaning and purpose. Some of the custodians looked at their work not just as cleaning rooms, but as promoting the health and of the patients and helping them to get better quicker. So they took this work very seriously. And they looked at, for example, um, how they clean the room and not only about just having a clean room, but making sure that there weren't germs that were going to keep the person sick. They looked at how they could connect one-on-one -on -one with people and form relationships. And that added so much meaning and purpose to them. And so, you know, one of the things that I, that I find here and that I love so much about Norwich, when I ask people what it is they like about their job, they will always say to me, the people and helping students. I don't care what the job is, but there's like this strong sense that everyone is here to help students be successful, right? No matter what it is. And so when we're faced with difficult challenges at work or tedious tasks that we don't really enjoy doing, reminding ourselves of the bigger purpose of why we're here can be very, very helpful. <clears throat> so the last construct of PERMA is achievement. And that means working towards and reaching your goals. It means delaying gratification in service of the thing that you really want in the long run. It means persevering in spite of challenge, and it means being gritty. So Angela Duckworth wrote a great book about grit that I highly recommend, um, and it's all about why we need grit in our lives and how we can cultivate more grit. So how can we develop more grit to achieve our goals? Number one, find something that interests us. Nobody wants to push through and work hard at something that isn't interesting, right? So what did you spend time doing as a kid? What, what activities absorb you so much that you just get lost in the moment of doing them? If money wasn't an issue, what would you spend your time doing? One of the best ways to develop grit is to intentionally do hard things, right? The more we can intentionally do hard things in our life, the easier life will be. So when it comes to grit, one of the other things we can do is engage in what we call deliberate practice. So there's this rule called the 10,000 hour rule. Is anyone familiar with the 10,000 hour rule? Yeah. The 10,000 hour rule basically says to get better at anything, you have to practice for 10,000 hours. But there's more to it than that because let's take guitar playing, for example. If I want to get better at guitar and I'm already kind of proficient and I just practice uh, the easy parts, for 10,000 hours, I'm never gonna really get better. I have to practice the parts that are really hard for me, whether it's one certain chord that I can't get or one note that I just can't reach my finger at. Um, that's how I get better, is deliberate practice at the hard things. And that can help us to develop grit. And there's easy ways to do this in our everyday life, whether that's you know spending two more minutes on the treadmill when you really don't wanna do it, or forcing yourself to not check your email when the, the ding goes off, right? So just looking at small ways that you can practice hardship and discomfort is one of the best ways to develop more grit. So we all know that life likes to throw curveballs at us, right? We can have the best of intentions, and life has a really funny way of trying to derail us. And so as I was thinking about PERMA and the effort it takes to live a good life, I couldn't help thinking to myself, how am I gonna remember 
not only these constructs, but how am I going to remember to take action in direction of these constructs? And I had an epiphany. And my epiphany was values. So values are not things, but they are ways of being. And values can really act as our North Star to guide us in certain directions. And so I was thinking about values, and I recall one of the things that um, first came to my attention when I came to Norwich, and that was the little card with the Norwich guiding values. And so I realized that is how we can remember. Because if we make decisions in alignment with the values, that will guide our way. So men and women of integrity and honor. Integrity builds trust, which in turn supports positive relationships. We're dedicated to learning, teamwork, creativity, and critical thinking. All of those things support achievement and relationships. We encourage service to others before self, supports meaning and purpose. We stress being physically fit. When we're physically fit, we're able to rise to the challenges, and that builds our confidence, which enhances our grit, enhances our flow, enhances our ability to achieve. We stress self-discipline and personal responsibility, again, supports grit and achievement, as does the Norwich motto of I will try. So when we're faced with obstacles or choices in our lives, we can look to these values to guide our behavior, and they will most certainly point us in the direction of flourishing. So now that you have the knowledge and the tools to move forward towards flourishing in your own life, it's time to act. This is where the rubber meets the road. So we need to take decisive action now, right? Life is short. If we're going to live the good life, we've got to start now. So and think about the constructs of PERMA, positive emotion, engagement, meaning and purpose, meaningful relationships, and achievement. Which areas are you flourishing in now, and which areas do you feel may be lacking? Flourishing and living the good life are really determined by intentional practice. Small, consistent action taken over time, is, over time is what will get us there. And there's no time like the present to start. So as you move through your day today, I, consider, I urge you to think about how you might find or build more positivity, how you might spread positivity to others, how you might add value to the people around you, how you might deepen a relationship, connect your work to a higher purpose, or work towards some goal that you've been wanting to achieve. So with that, I will leave you with a quote from Anne Frank, and she says, how wonderful it is that no one has to wait, but we can start right now to gradually change the world. Thank you very much. Another round of applause, please, for Rebecca Schubert. Thank you. All right, folks, a reminder, lunch here at 12.05. Otherwise, good news, it's time to get up out of our metal folding chairs and head to your sessions. Enjoy the morning sessions, folks. We'll see you for lunch. Thank you, Rebecca.